These things Paul spoke while in a Roman prison. He was in prison for the crime of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only way of salvation was so important to Paul that even though he was already in prison for this crime, so-called crime, he continually preached and wrote. And one of the things that he wrote so beautifully, it says, when I suffer trouble, he says, as an evildoer, even unto the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Will you please rise with me as we sing our first hymn this morning, Rock of Ages. Rock of ages, left for me, let me hide myself in thee. gracious Heavenly Father, it is truly wonderful to live in this land of the free and home of the brave, and especially to be able to be here in your house this morning. We have prayed for 49 years that you would someday intervene and stop this terrible sin of Roe v. Wade. Today we are excited that once again in this land, life is sacred. For you are the giver of life, and all life belongs to you for your judgment and your approval. We are here and have what we have only by thy grace. Truly, that is a miracle, for each of us could be living in a desolate sandy desert or on a remote mountaintop with little food and water, unable to hear your word or worship at your throne. I can see myself in all sorts of terrible places, living terrible lives, and I am so thankful none of them are me. We could very easily be worshipers of some other religion, serving dumb idols or false gods who do not hear or answer our prayers. But you have chosen each one of us, and you have set us here in this place where our lives are safe and full of wonderful things. You have made our lives easy compared to those who live far away from here. 
but there is a reason and purpose. Each of us are here. Paul found that it was not easy to spread your gospel, but he also found that the gift of salvation was such a wonderful gift he could do nothing with his life but spend it spreading that gospel. You have set each of us here in this place, and like Paul, we must find our voices, for there is nothing on this planet so important. Help us to find that reason and purpose for our lives. Help us to find our voices. Bless our efforts to worship you with our praise and our song, and teach us to find dedication in our hearts. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated as we sing Majesty. Worship His Majesty. Majesty. Worship His Majesty. Unto Jesus be our Of reading this morning is from Psalms 68, 3 and 4, as we continue our reading through the Psalms and in this fashion. Let righteous people rejoice and celebrate in God's presence. Let the Lord flow with joy and make music to praise his name. Lift a song to him who rides upon the clouds. Amen. Isn't it wonderful to be able to read in a Bible where it says that we should, we should uh, praise the Lord, we should celebrate, we should make music and enjoy. I find it it's just so wonderful to read uh, David in the Psalms and the, the joy that David must have had in his heart knowing that he had a God. He had a God who loved him and saved him and, and was going to take care of him and that he could sing those praises. Our memory verse this morning is from Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing. It means don't worry about nothing. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests 
be made known unto God. Philippians 4.6 You know, and that's more than just a memory verse. We need to know that uh, this week and every week I'm, I'm, I'm the, uh, in a position where prayer is, is important. As I'll let you know in a little bit, Jean is in the hospital and we've had to go to God in prayer uh, many times. And, and I know uh, Linda came in this morning. I, I had a tough time sleeping. Wake up, woke up in the middle of the night and had to go pray. Linda comes in this morning and said she woke up in the middle of the night and had to go had to go pray. And I guess maybe God was was working on our hearts to to uh, uh, to pray. Uh, but uh, uh, but in everything we should learn to go to the Lord and make requests or make our prayers known unto God. I can only imagine. song this morning after watching young people in front of the Supreme Court dancing with joy. Young people dancing with joy over the reversal of Roe v. Wade. Some of the young 
ladies, young ladies in that group. I mean, they were, they really got their dancing on. <laughs> so they were dancing with such great joy. And then to hear them talk about how back in their universities and in their hometowns and, and that, how they created and worked so hard over the years to create pro-life groups. Truly was a joy. And they will share that joy with our Lord Jesus Christ. And they worked so hard to preserve life. That life is important. Good morning. I guess maybe it's going to rain today. I hope. I hope. I'm praying for a little rain. I've been watering. Where I live, we have to pay for water and sewer. So every drop of water, I'm paying for a water and the sewer of it, even though I put it on my garden. But my poor plants have, have needed water. Fortunately, I don't have to do that here. So I had sprinklers out around here at the church this week. But it's good to be here in the house of the Lord this morning. And it's good to have all of you here and to see all of you there. I had a wonderful time uh, uh, this week. I was supposed to preach a sermon. I will, t I will tell, uh, tell about myself. So if you're over in the Embassy of Park Avenue, you know, I, again, I apologize. I was supposed to go and preach a sermon there at 2 o'clock. But I thought that, that I was going to replace Bible study at 3 o'clock. And so I got there a little early, and uh, we couldn't make the, the music go, but we'll do that the next time. And uh, I had a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Bible study with a great group of people. And I want us to, uh, when we go to prayer, keep those people in prayer as well. Um, Bible study here at 7 p.m. And counseling, if you need counseling for anything, please give us a call at 814 967 36 Two eight. We're trying to. We're still. I've still got the ability to get a few kids left uh, for July into uh, uh, Camp Judson for summer camp, uh, and then it's over. It's that's the end. And and uh, you know, uh, I'm praying and hoping that somebody, uh, some of you people out there, will want to send some kids to Camp Judson and just give me a call. 814-967-3628. I've been advertising that on the on the radio and, and here on this program. But I I know that some of you have grandchildren and children and and neighbors uh, that you might encourage. And you can tell the parent, you know, I, I don't let transportation be a problem. Don't let money be a problem. If you get somebody that want to get to wants to go to uh, 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 Camp Tutson, a Christian uh, summer camp. Please give me a call. What I can't imagine in our day is, and I know people are watching us, that nobody's calling to go, that the camps are, are not being filled up. That is, that is uh, that, that's difficult for me to, to, to understand when I know that the kids have so much. What, what else is there to do? We, we're so busy on our cell phones. Is that what it is, Chris? We're just really busy on our cell phones. We, we don't have anything else to do. We know how to exercise these things here, and we don't need anything else. It reminds me of the story of the, of the, the boy, uh, the, the man who uh, was raising a, a son, and, and uh, he said, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. I, I, I didn't know how to. To, to be a, a father, I had to learn as I go, like all of us. And he says, so when when uh, my son got to be four years old, I took him out on the lawn and I threw a bell at him. And I figured that, that if he reached out to defend himself or catch the ball or do something, I was going to the, hard, to the uh, uh, sporting goods and I was going to buy a, a, a glove. But if he ducked and he started crying, he said, now I knew I was going to start looking for piano teachers. So, but I don't know what you, I don't know what you do today when, when uh, the kids know nothing about anything other than being on, the, on their cell phones and why that, why when, when it uh, is so damaging. But, 
But anyway, uh, yeah, and you know, sometimes we have to push a little bit. I know that I do. All right. Um, so I want to continue to keep uh, the ladies that uh, keep calling and that are on our prayer list, Mary and Nora, Miriam and, and Mary Ann and, and uh, uh, Abby and, and Eric and Mike and Charlie and, and uh, uh, the whole mess of kids that just graduated. Uh, but I also want to keep uh, uh, Jean in prayer. Jean had a, had a, uh, a, a bout um, and uh, we didn't make it, believe that he was going to make it through. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of praying. At one time, I thought Gene had a stroke, but uh, thank God he, he didn't. But his, his uh, kidney uh, seemed to uh, not be working properly. And, and, uh, and so we, he's in the hospital over in Meadville, and we're asking for continued care for, for Gene as well. Um, I also want to... Uh, has prayer for uh, the people at uh, the Abbotsy of Park Avenue. We had a wonderful, wonderful Bible study. Uh, even had people that were part of, I don't know if I should say that, but were part of uh, the the staff there want to sit in on Bible study. A very, uh, a very uh, uh, important part of the Bible study uh, that went on last week. So we want to keep those people in prayer as well. Um, anyone this morning have a praise, God working miracles, wonderful things in your life? I, I know one of our praises is that, that Gene is, you know, didn't have a stroke and, and uh, that uh, uh, we think that the doctors are going to continue to work on him and, and that uh, we're, we're prayed and I ask God for a full recovery. So that's what I'm expecting. I went up there and I prayed and I I prayed that I told told God I've got one hand on the throne of grace and one hand on Gene and I am praying for complete uh, complete recovery and and that's what I'm expecting. I'm expecting that God's going to answer that prayer. Anyone else this morning have a have a prayer request, a, a praise? If you're at home, if you're watching us from um, uh, one of the nursing homes that, that watch us uh, on uh, Armstrong uh, Cable, uh, channel 100 or uh, or six or or any of the other, is it six or three? Three. I keep saying six. I don't know why. It's six in another place. I was at three in Titusville, uh, 100, uh, most other places. And if you uh, are there, uh, please, uh, please watch our program. We have a lot to say. But uh, we want to keep uh, you in prayer as well. Anyone else this morning? Yes. And our unsaved, loved ones. And our unsaved yes. Anyone else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for being the author of so many blessings. I thank you for Paul's writing to let me know that even though he was a, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, he was accused uh, of breaking a, a law in chain to the Praetorian Guard in prison. And even there, he spread the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. Even when he was in chains, he couldn't break his spirit down and the message had to go forward. I thank you for teaching us that and I pray that you help us to be that kind of person. To be able to, to be so full of of needing prayer for your husband, but yet on the top of your mind is to ask for prayer for our unsaved loved ones. To ask for prayer for our family members and those who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, we just ask you to be with this country and I thank you so much for the ruling of the Supreme Court that godly people can understand that life belongs to you and not to the government. 
We ask you to continue to be with this church and to help us to grow. And we ask you to be with all of our loved ones and all of those that we've lifted up here. Watch over this country and help us to be the people that we need to be. And all these things we ask in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and the Father. To him be glory. scripture this morning is from Galatians chapter 2, 11 through 21. When Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I, that's Paul, he wrote Galatians, I had to openly oppose him because he was completely wrong. He ate with people who were not Jewish until some men James had sent from Jerusalem arrived. Then Cephas, Peter, drew back and would not associate with people who were not Jewish. He was afraid of those who insisted that circumcision was necessary. The other Jewish Christians also joined him in his hypocrisy. Even Barnabas was swept along with him. But I saw that they were not properly following the truth of the good news. So I told Cephas in front of everyone, you're Jewish but you live like a person who is not Jewish. So how can you insist that people who are not Jewish must live like Jews? 
We are Jewish by birth, not sinners from other nations. Yet we know that people don't receive God's approval because of their own efforts to live according to a set of standards, but only by believing in Jesus Christ. So we also believe in Jesus Christ in order to receive God's approval by faith in Christ, and not because of our own efforts. People won't receive God's approval because of their own efforts to live according to a set of standards. If we, the same people who are searching for God's approval in Christ, are still sinners, does that mean that Christ encourages us to sin? That's unthinkable. If I rebuild something that I have torn down, I admit that I was wrong to tear it down. When I tried to obey the law's standards, those laws killed me. As a result, I live in a relationship with God. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live by believing in God's Son, who loved me and took the punishment for my sins. I don't reject God's grace. If we receive God's approval by, by obeying laws, then Christ's death was pointless. By faith alone. I had a wonderful opportunity again last week to be part of a marvelous Bible study, as we said earlier, at Embassy Park of, uh, Avenue in Meadville. Though we were studying in Genesis, there was two topics brought up along the way that required special attention. The first was asked why there was so many denominations and which one of them had the correct answer. The second was confusion about faith and works. And I can, if you know me, I can go on and on and on and on and on and on and on about this idea that faith requires something else to, to go with it to produce salvation. It doesn't. And Paul tries to teach us in nearly every way possible that faith alone saves. We just read that. It is interesting to me because it appears that Paul had to deal with this very exact same thing. These exact questions were being raised in Galatia. And Peter was adding to the confusion and needed to be corrected by Paul. And then if you re read further in the Bible, you know that they brought it up again in Jerusalem in front of James, the brother of Jesus. These are the kind of things that have brought us so many different denominations. Now some are way out there in left field, so much so that I could really argue they are not different denominations, but actually different religions that hold to some piece of Christianity, maybe some even unimportant piece of Christianity. Groups but that believe they can and should pray their dead relatives into heaven, for instance. But the majority of Christian denominations have been created around something other than the birth, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul tells us right here that if we believe in Jesus Christ, we are saved. Denominations may teach us we can be born again and lose our salvation. Paul teaches us differently. Peter would have you be born again as a Jew and need circumcision. Some believe that you must have a specific membership in a certain church, complete certain vows, have a certain handshake, be a certain kind of person, live a special kind of life. Paul argues with great passion, even against Peter, who was with Jesus Christ at that time, or before that time, but had been with Jesus Christ and had a great reputation for being with Jesus. Remember, Paul was not. Even against Peter and those apostles close to Peter, that everyone who accepts Jesus Christ by faith alone is saved. Remember, that even though Jesus, or even though Peter 
and the other apostles were with Jesus Christ. And as Peter tells, told us last week, had been with him after the resurrection, it was God who blinded Paul, and it was God who taught Paul for 12 years before he went out on the road and preached. The church in Antioch was largely a Gentile church, although it was a mixture of Jew and Gentile. Not Christ, but different eating habits were about to cause different groups of denominations forming and would have if it had not been for Paul. Two tables were established. One was the kosher table and the other was the Gentile table. Paul ate at the Gentile table, although he was a Jew. He ate with the Gentiles because he taught that whatever you eat, whether you eat meat or you don't eat meat, makes no difference whatsoever. Meat will not commend you to God. Eating meat or not eating meat had nothing to do with salvation. Faith alone in Jesus Christ brought salvation, period. Peter had been a believer for some time when he came to visit Paul in Antioch. When the time came to eat, Simon Peter went over to the kosher table, while Paul went over to the Gentile table. Later, Paul teaches Peter that under grace, you can either eat meat or not eat meat. It makes no difference. Meat won't commend you to God, as I said. Peter's original position would have taught that the Gentile table was wrong and that the kosher table was the right table. That's why it was important to Paul. Now, these brethren from, from Jerusalem were austere legalists, and under grace, that was their privilege. But Simon Peter turned from the liberty he had in Christ back to Judaism again. He was so comfortable living under the law, he just had to incorporate it somehow into his Christianity. And that is what I find a lot of our denominations have done. Try to incorporate the law or some form of law, some rules that they've invented into Christianity. And I find that is exactly what has caused many of our denominations to leave one table set before the Lord Jesus Christ and go sit at another table also set before the Lord Jesus Christ. Martin Luther, like Paul, had a legitimate argument. After receiving finally a German translation of the Bible, Martin Luther was angry and astonished that he had for so many years been misled and mistaught by the Catholic Church. Remember, Luther was a Catholic priest who had attained some notoriety. He was an intelligent person, but he was preaching the dogma that he had been taught. He knew all about Catholic law and about pointing fingers and condemning. Dogmatic Catholicism had no place in it for the love of God and Christ Jesus. And Luther was astonished. He was flabbergasted to discover that the Bible had more in it about love that set us free than the bondage of fear and hate. And that's why he left the Catholic Church and put up his theses on, on the Edinburgh, on the, on the church door. The nature of Paul's rebuke shows, first of all, the inconsistent, inconsistency of law-keeping. But somehow Christianity just has never gotten that point. The Jew in that day looked upon the Gentiles as a sinner. In fact, Gentile and sinner were the same term, where they were synonymous, they were interchangeable terms. Therefore, the rebuke that Paul gave shows the folly of law-keeping. How really foolish law keeping was and is, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Sometimes big religious words get us confused. So let's just make it simple. 
justified means simply our sins are forgiven and we are right with God. There's nothing that stands between us. Justified means that our penalty for our sins have been paid for and there is nothing that stands between us and God. We are now one with Christ. We can become one with Christ because nothing, nothing separates us from Christ. God sees us in Christ. If you are born again, that's where he sees us, in Christ. That's why we can come boldly before the throne of grace. So let's reread that verse. Because I think many people get lost in this word of justification. And it's one of those things that, that I call a mouthful word. And let's reread it using the simple word that all of us can understand saved, knowing that a man is not saved by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be saved by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be saved. This is a clear cut and simple statement of justification or saved by faith. And as Paul repeatedly tries to teach us, saved by faith alone. Believe me, the legalist and denominationalist has trouble with this verse. This verse will upset every legal system there is today. To say that you have to add anything to faith in Christ absolutely mutilates the gospel. The good news. Notice that Paul says here, if a Jew had to leave the law behind, that is, forsake it, in order to be justified by faith, Paul's question is, why should the Gentile, or anyone, or everyone else be brought under the law? Knowing that a man, let's now pick that verse apart, this is something you can know. You can know whether you are saved or not. One of the marvelous things and a lot of people are, are, are in churches today not knowing whether they are saved. People live miserable lives not knowing that they are saved. But you can know, Paul tells us repeatedly, you can know you are saved. Now let's pick this verse apart as I said. This is something you can know. You can know whether you are saved or not. What kind of man is this verse speaking about? Anthropos is the Greek word, a generic term meaning mankind. It speaks of the solidarity of the race, the common humanity that we all have. This breaks the social barrier of color. It breaks the barrier of race. It breaks the social barrier. All men are on one level before the cross. And that level happens to be sinner. You are a sinner. I am a sinner. I don't care who you are. You are a sinner in God's sight. Before you are saved. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. The word, the, that you see there, is not in the original text. So it should actually read, not justified or not saved by works of law. You cannot be saved by works of law. This includes the Mosaic system and includes any and every legal system. This is what I, this is what I mean. If you say that you have to join a certain church, or that you have to have a certain experience, or that you have to be uh, baptize or speak in tongues to be saved, you are contradicting this verse. Knowing that a man is not justified or saved by works of law, any law. Paul embraces the whole legal system that is found in every religion. This makes Christianity different from every other religion on the top side of this earth. Every religion that I know about today, and I have studied many of them, even those that are dead, cults and religions of the world, 
instructs us to do something. Christianity is different. It tells us that we are justified, that we are saved by faith. That is, faith is an accomplished act and fact for you. Every other religion says do. Christianity says done. Many of our denominations say you have to do something. But real Christianity says it's done. The greatest transaction is done. And we are asked to believe it. That is faith. Have faith that the work of bringing salvation to the world is a complete, completed act. And that work, all that work, was done and accomplished by Jesus Christ. There is no active work you can do to add to it. It is already perfect. You can't make it any more perfect. To do that dis depreciates the work of the Lord Jesus on the cross when he came to, its, to this earth to die for you and work out a salvation so perfect that when he went back to heaven, what did he do? He sat down at the right hand of God because it is complete. He sat down because there was nothing else left to be done. If there had been anything else, he would have done it before he sat down. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church. We have everything in him. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Amen, as we just sang. And when you say amen, you are through, right? Christ did it all. This verse is so clear, it is impossible to misunderstand it. Knowing that a man, any human being, man or woman, black or white, rich or poor, Roman, American, Chinese, is not justified or saved by works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. It is not faith plus something. It is faith plus nothing. Faith alone saves. The verse continues. Even if we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Who does Paul mean by we? He includes himself, meaning we Israelites. He is saying that he and his fellow Jews had to leave the law to come to Christ and trust him in order to be justified by the faith of Christ rather than by the works of the law. The conclusion of this verse is so clear, I feel that everybody can and should be able to understand it. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, Paul tells us, or be saved, if you prefer. Let not let's not depreciate the work of the Lord Jesus Christ by saying that we didn't get everything we needed from him. I was a hell doomed sinner. I trusted Jesus as my savior. I received a perfect salvation from him. Every person who accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is now declared righteous. The righteousness I have is not my own righteousness because my righteousness is not acceptable. But I have a perfect righteousness, which is Christ. For I thought, for I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Paul is saying, when Christ died, he died for me. He died for my he died in my stead because the law had condemned me. He not only took my place and died for me, but he also did something else. He was able to give me life because he came back from the dead. Now, we are to live by faith. Faith in what? Faith in the Son of God. You see, the death of Christ upon the cross was not the only penal that is saying, paying the penalty for our sin, but it was substitutionary also. He was not only the sacrifice for sin, he was the substitute for all who believe. Paul 
declares, therefore, that under the law, he was tried, that he was found guilty, was condemned, and in the person of his substitute, he was slain. When all that takes place, it took place when Christ was crucified. Paul was crucified, as you and I are, with Christ. But nevertheless, I live. How do I live? In Christ. He is alive today at God's right hand. We are told that we have been put in Christ. You cannot improve on that. There's nothing we can do to make that better. That ought to get rid of any foolish notion that we can crucify ourselves. Christ died a substitutionary death. He died for Paul. He died for you. He died for me. After Jesus was crucified, dead, buried, and rose again, as stated earlier, he rose and sat on the right hand of God the Father. Paul says that we do not know him anymore after the flesh. He is not the man that walked along the route along the Sea of Galilee and healed people anymore. He's not that person. He's not there today. He is at God's right hand. He is the glorified Christ. All too often we want to keep Jesus as that person. But after he rose again, he is now the Son of God. And he, as he was before he came to earth, a, a human baby. He has taken back his position as we find him in the book of Revelation. The Lord of armies, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great high priest. When he returns, every knee will bow. Whether you believe in Jesus Christ or don't believe in Jesus Christ, whether you accept Jesus Christ or don't accept Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ returns, I promise you, every knee, every demon, every, every angel, every knee will bow. Christ loved me, but he could not love me into heaven. Even though Christ loved me with all his heart, he couldn't love me into heaven. He had to give himself for me. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. You can receive this gift only by faith. It is yours. But you have to reach out in faith and take it before it belongs to you. God offers you the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Won't you reach out into the, God's hand and take it? We always have this argument, this discussion, when people talk to me about, about uh, God being able to take back his gift of salvation, and I'm wondering, how is that even possible? That you can be born again and lost, and born again and lost, and born again and lost. And I also, I ask, you know, especially when I'm out there, are you your grandparents, right? Your grandparents here, did you ever give a gift to a child? Well, almost everybody has given a gift for a child. So I ask, I want to see hands. How many of you have ever taken that gift back away from the child that you gave them? And I almost never get a hand up. See, God, God's not that person either. God gave you a gift and he doesn't take it back. Won't you reach out and take that gift that God is trying to give you freely? That is all God asks from you. Accept his gift and believe. Have faith. That gift writes your name eternally. It's that acceptance. It's reaching into God's hand and accepting that faith and having faith that writes your name eternally in the book of life where it cannot be erased. Your name will be called out and you will rise with the rest of us who believe and have faith to meet Jesus Christ in the air when he calls us. And that could happen at any moment. I am so thankful. As I've said, about the Supreme Court ruling. When Jesus Christ comes, he won't be calling us from some of the horror that we've put ourselves in. But he can come at any moment. 
the prophecies have been fulfilled and Christ can come at any time. Won't you reach into his hand and accept the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. I hear my dedication this morning is all that I have. Again, from Esther Moy. of God and he was willing to give all back to the Lord Jesus Christ for all that he had everything he had and everything we have comes to us by God I want you this morning to take this opportunity as we go in prayer as we bow our heads and close our eyes and as we pray for you and all of our unsaved loved ones for people around who do not yet know Jesus Christ I want you to know this great joy because Paul had to be in joy how is it you can be in prison in a dungeon in a Roman dungeon under the ground almost no light not knowing where your meals are coming from because the government didn't provide them 
and still be in joy. You can have that joy, that peace, knowing Jesus Christ.